Hello, my name is John Corstein, and I am Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariner's Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia. And I'm here to tell you about the fascinating story of the Battle of Drury's Bluff. You know, the um, CSS Virginia had emerged from the Elizabeth River on March 8, 1862, destroyed two wooden warships, destroyed transports, damaged three other ships, and on the next day when it came back to finish off the Union wooden warships, it met with the Monitor, and all of a sudden a stalemate occurred in Hampton Roads. Now, what's going to happen is that uh, George Britton McClellan, commander of the Army of the Potomac, has come up with this brilliant plan known as the Peninsula Campaign. And he is wanting to go and bring his troops down to Fort Monroe and from there march up the peninsula using the James River and the York River as his where he can carry his supplies, where he can guard his flanks and go straight 70 miles away to Richmond, Virginia. He has 121,500 men, 102 siege guns, etc. So he has an amazing amount of material. So his army will start to arrive at the Fort Monroe and at another spot known as Newport News Point Camp Butler beginning on March 17, 1862. Now the big trouble is how, what is the situation about the Virginia? And so McClellan asked Gustavus Vasa Fox, the um, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for the uh, Union, and can the Monitor protect me? And Fox says, well, yes, I believe she will do best in the next engagement, but you never know, basically. So uh, all of a sudden, McClellan hinges his campaign on the ability of the monitor. Now, the big issue is that the Virginia is a threat or a force in being, as we would say, because the commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, Louis Malshebras Goldsboro, uh, who's five foot 10, 350 pounds, you know, he's not very fast. And the big thing is he's suffering from a dreaded disease in spring of 1862, known as Ram fever or Merrimack on the brain. He thinks the Merrimack, the Virginia as we would call it, could do everything it wanted to do. And he refused when McClellan arrives. He says, well, you can't count on me much and you can't use the James River because the, Vir the Merrimack blocks that river to our use. Then all of a sudden, um, McClellan decides to, against the advice of his engineer in chief, John Gross Bernard, to attack Norfolk first. He instead moves against the Confederate position at Yorktown. Unbelievable, Major General John Bankhead Magruder, known as Prince John, has built a tremendous defensive line across the peninsula, which is called by Robert E. Lee as the best place to defend Richmond on the peninsula. And as McClellan moves up the peninsula, he runs into Magruder's army of 13,000 men, and it, Magruder puts on this great bluff, according to Mary Chestnut uh, Boykin, <laughs> that Magruder paraded his 10,000 men before McClellan like fireflies and utterly deluded him. So what's gonna happen is McClellan asks Goldsboro, can you come and run past the batteries on the York River at Yorktown and Gloucester Point? And Goldsboro says, no. So they break down into a sea. The siege begins on April 5th, 1862, and will last until May 3rd, 1862, when the Confederates that evening will withdraw from their position because the commander then is, of course, Joseph Eggleston Johnson, who's brought his army to reinforce Magruder. And so all of a sudden, the Confederates begin to retreat, which results in the May 5th Battle of Williamsburg now. 
all of a sudden, Abraham Lincoln, who's disturbed with the um, how fast the Union is moving in Hampton Roads and why the James River isn't open, he will go down to Fort Monroe himself. And he meets with the commander of the Union Department of Virginia, John Ellis Wool, and Goldsboro, who's commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. What's going on? Why can't we move into the James River? And of course, Goldsboro says, oh my gosh, it's the, Vir the Merrimack. She's in our way. We can't do anything about her. He says, well, well this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a two-prong attack. And next... And that two-prong attack is going to go um, against Sewell's Point, which is going to be led by the Monitor and the uh, Nagatuck, the Susquehanna, San Jacinto, Dakota, and Seminole. And they go to shell Sewell's Point batteries. Meanwhile, Commander John Rogers, who's commander of the ironclad known as the Galena, will take the Galena and the uh, uh, Nog he takes the Galena, the Roostock, and Port Royal and goes into the James River where he bombards two Confederate forts, Fort Boykin on Burwell's Bay, and then Fort Hugi, or Hugi, depends on how you want to say it, uh, uh, on uh, what is known as Day's Point. And so they bombard those, they put them out of action. Now, when the Virginia hears this all going on, she will emerge from the Elizabeth River and her captain at that time is Flag Officer Josiah Tattenall. What should he do? Should he try to go after the Union forces in the James River or defend Norfolk by attacking the Monitor? Well, his draft after 22 feet will not allow him to go that far up the James River. So he goes after the monitor. Now I wanna tell you, Abraham Lincoln is watching everything at Fort Wool, also known as the Rip Raps in the middle of Hampton Roads. And he sees the monitor as the Virginia emerges. I gotta tell you, Tattenall tells his men, we will fight until our death. We will sink before surrender. You go to your stations, I'll go to mine. He went up and sat on an easy chair on the hurricane deck of the Virginia. Well, and move against the federal um, flotilla. And what will happen is that the monitor and her supporting ships will retreat. Um, Lincoln is so mad, he throws down his hat. He then gets into a tug. He goes over to Ocean View, which is a beach area about four and a half miles away from Fort Monroe, but it's on the Chesapeake Bay. So he goes there, he gets in a rowboat, goes to shore, walks along the beach and says, this is where we're going to come. He goes back to Wool and says, we're going to attack them. So on the evening of May 9th, Union forces will land at Ocean View and march towards Norfolk. The Confederacy is in a, in a hard place because since Joe Johnson has retreated, Norfolk is isolated. And so the commander of the Department of Norfolk, Benjamin Huji, will decide to abandon Norfolk. They torch the Navy Yard. This is the second time in, within uh, just a little over a year that the Navy Yard has been, they've attempted to destroy it. The Confederates then leave. The Virginia, isolated, will then have a decision to make. Tattenall says, well, we should attack the Union fleet and go down game. And his subordinate officer says, oh, wait a second. We could be damaged. They could capture us, and they would be able to use our ship. So then Tattenall said, well, let's take her out to sea and go down to Savannah. And the officers all go, well, wait a second. This ship is like a forlorn turtle. You know, she's unseaworthy. And so then they try to lighten the ship to take it up to Richmond. But in the early morning of May 11th, 1862, they find they cannot lessen the draft sufficiently. And so they will run the ship aground and scuttle her. What a 
sad finish to such a bright beginning, one of the crew members said. Well, without the Virginia, the James River is open. Rogers has already proven that it could be. And so Rogers will join up with the Monitor and the Naugatuck next. And uh, the Monitor, of course, we all know about her, turret, two guns. Let me explain. The Kalina has a, this is the destruction of the Virginia. This is really what puts the Confederacy in danger. In fact, President Jefferson Davis will say, huh, you know, we might have to abandon Richmond. He goes to Lee, said, where should we go? Well, the best way, place to defend ourselves is over on uh, the river, Stanton River, but Richmond will be saved. So he sends his son, um, Custis Lee, to go down to this bluff, eight miles below Richmond, right after this curve that starts at Chaffin's Bluff and then ends at Drury's Bluff, eight miles straight shot to Richmond from there. And there they begin building fortifications. Now I gotta tell you, they start on May 11th and you can imagine how difficult it is to build the gun emplacements. They use the men at hand. They have about uh, 180 uh, soldiers. They rent slaves to build three gun emplacements. And then on May 12th, next, will the crew of the Virginia show up and they then will take guns off the CSS Yorktown and also the CSS Jamestown. The Jamestown is sunk as part of the obstructions in the river. Now the Federals appear to have a tremendous advantage. The big thing is, is that they have ironclads like the one you're looking at right now, which is the USS Monitor. It is apparently totally shot proof. Um, she is nine feet off the water, armed with two 11 inch uh, Dahlgren's shell guns and uh, has you know, been a success so far. With her will be the USS Galena. And the Galena, is a different style of ironclad. It has the tumble home design. In fact, it's kind of like a, a turtle back. And it's plated with three layers of one inch iron plate, which is placed upon her, it's called clinker built if you are really into uh, medieval ships, but it's like clapboard. Actually, Roger says it's a punk ship. It really cannot withstand shot. Nevertheless, it has two 100-pounder Parrot rifles, and it has four 11-inch uh, Dahlgren guns. With her will be the also the Naugatuck. Now, the Naugatuck started in 1848. It's known as the Stevens Battery. It has proven to be a failure, but when the war breaks out, the Stevens family finishes it, and what the ship is able to do, it's iron-hulled, and it can lower itself in the water when in battle, and it has a 100-pounder parrot positioned on it. However, that 100-pounder parrot is in parapet. In other words, she's out in the open, ready to fire. So that doesn't make the crew, the gun crew, very safe. Nevertheless, we also have the two gunboats, the Rustock and the Port Royal. So as they go up river, they stop at Fort G again, at Jamestown Island, at uh, City Point. So they're slowly going up river, not knowing that the Confederates are desperate to finish their defenses at Drury's Bluff. So what's gonna happen is, is that the crew of the Virginia um, and the overall post is commanded by a man known as Ebenezer Farron, slide please, and it is also the Virginia's crew is going to be commanded by H.B. Ackle Roger Jones. Now, they rush to try and complete. As this map shows you, uh, basically you can see where Fort Monroe is, where Magruder's position across the Warwick River to Yorktown and to Gloucester Point, 
That is holding the Federals. And then the Federals will, uh, the Confederates will retreat. They fight the Battle of Williamsburg. Meanwhile, the Federals, uh, where you see the name Heinzelman, uh, that's very where the A is, is very close to where Fort Fuji is located. So you can imagine the Galena um, and uh, the Rustock and the Port Royal coming up the river, bombarding that earthwork that is, you know, top of the line if you're fighting war in 1840, designed by uh, uh, Colonel Talcott. So anyway, what happens is they, the federal fleet then starts going up river. Now you can see how the river narrows and then it takes these turns. Then there's a bluff it has got to pass. And then the next curve brings you to Drury's Bluff. And then there's a straight, as we call a reach to Richmond. Oh my gosh. So the Confederates are rushing to build this fort. Richmond's in a panic for two reasons. Number one, McClellan's army is reaching towards Richmond while the Navy, the US Navy is coming up the river. This is dangerous for the Confederates. The crew of the CSS Virginia will mount five, five additional guns um, actually, excuse me, three additional guns. One seven inch brook is going to be put in a log casemate, believe it or not. And so there they await. They had just finished their fortifications on May 14th. So slide please. Um, the federal fleet um, will, this is uh, Ebenezer Ferran, uh, slide please. Um, and uh, he is overall commander. This is Catesby App Roger Jones, who is now in command of the contingent of sailors from the CSS Virginia. And so they, uh, he, he hasn't slept in um, two days, believe it or not, rushing to build these fortifications. He actually, during the battle, will nod off asleep because this is, a different type of battle than any land battle. Slide, please. So, on the morning of, so let me get this timeline straight. Now you can see the reach in the river. So, what the Confederates have done is right where you see the dark green, right along that line of the river, they have. Um, five gun emplacements. They're building two others that have a natural shot right down that reach towards Chaffin's Bluff. Then Lieutenant John Taylor Wood has placed skirmishers or sharpshooters along the riverbank, very wooded, and so that as the federal ships come up, that they're going to be able to fire at them. This is, uh, Drew's Bluff is also called Fort Darling. Now, let me tell you about the people at Drury's Bluff, the Confederates. They have what is known as the South Side Artillery, which had been organized by Augustus Herman Drury, who owns the place. He has organized the South Side um, Artillery. They have two eight inch Columbiads that are positioned looking straight down the river. Next to their position will be a 10 inch Columbiad that is going to be uh, actually manned by a unit known as the Bedford Artillery. These guys are from Bedford, Virginia. They've never handled heavy cannon before. And then as you go a little further up the river, you, that's where the log casemate with a seven inch brook gun. And then two other positions will have rifled 32 pounder guns. And what the Confederates had learned is they could take these old 32 pounder shell guns and they could heat it up, they're cast iron, and then they put a wrought iron band around it. And then using um, a drill, they place seven lands and grooves in the gun so it becomes rifled. I wouldn't want to fire one of those, but that's okay. So anyway, so on the morning of May 15th, slide please, we're going to see the Union, uh, now this is the Naugatuck. So you see, this is um, 
uh, really not a very safe ship. It may be called an ironclad, but that parrot gun is just not a good place to fire, try to fire your gun. What you're supposed to do is when you have a shot, you fire it, and then you go into that armored box right there, wait for the enemy to fire, then go back out, load your gun, fire it, and go back in. So it's known as the Stevens Battery, and actually the Navy never accepted it. It's part of the U.S. Revenue Cutter Service. Slide, please. So uh, you can see the Federals have a tremendous advantage. But if you look at this slide, you can see the Confederate advantage. Now, this is a banded 42-pounder. You can see the band on it, um, and it's banded by Brook, so it's a double band, and you can see the river right in front of you. So this is the type of fortifications the Confederates had built. Drury's Bluff is 90 feet above the water's edge. Slide, please. Um, and so what's going to happen now, you can see this is the Federals coming forward. Now, in the lead is going to be the Galena. Following the Galena will be the USS Monitor. And not in the scene is the Naugatuck, uh, but you can see the Port Royal and a Rustock. This is an artist imagining the scene. Then you can see the obstructions. So for the Federals to get to Richmond, and let me just tell you, had the Monitor or the Galena or any Union warship gotten up to what is called um, uh, Shaco Bottom or the Rockets. That's where the fall line is. If you get a Union ship there with an 11-inch Dahlgren or 100-pounder Parrot, they can shell the actual capital building of the Confederacy and of Virginia. Richmond would be forced to surrender. So, but to get past those obstructions, you have to neutralize the fort up on the bluff so that then you can take the time to remove these obstructions. So, a very difficult situation for the Federals. Slide, please. So, what we have is on the morning of May 15th at 6 o'clock, the Federal fleet gets underway. Um, they will be anchored at Kingsland Creek. They reach up past Chaffin's Bluff, and then they approach Drury's Bluff. Now, I have to tell you that uh, you can see the battery up on the bluff. So the scene is going to show you the um, what is known as the Galena, the Monitor, the Aroostock, the Port Royal, and the Naugatuck. Now, at 745, Galena, according to Charles Hasker, who's a boatswain's mate from the CSS Virginia, who's manning a gun up there on the bluff, will actually uh, say that the greatest seamanship he ever saw as how the Galena positioned herself and started to fire at the Un uh, Confederate fort. Now, this is a slow battle. Why? Because the big guns take uh, six to as so much as 10 minutes to load. Um, you, so you fire, you got to reload, and the same thing goes with the people up at Drury's Bluff. So, however, um, at the very beginning of the battle, the third gun in position, the 10-inch Columbiad, the Bedford Artillery, they double shot the gun. Now, you're not supposed to do that with heavy artillery. So when they fire the gun the first time, it goes back on the carriage on the truck and falls off the truck. And the, so that gun's disabled. And yet the first shot fired by the seven inch Brook gun will actually pierce the sides of the Galena and the eight inch Columbiads and the 32 pounder rifle guns do great damage to that ship, I have to tell you. Now, the monitor will actually, when they seize all the damage that is striking the Galena, the monitor will try to position herself forward. However, she cannot elevate her guns adequately. And so she's ineffective. So she has to drop behind the Galena. Um, now, basically, um, I don't know how many of you, well, 
since I was director of the USS Monitor Center, I actually been in the turret tons of times, and you can actually see a rifle brook bolt that bores into the turret and uh, actually brings a three inch hole in the side of the turret. Now the turret's eight inches deep, so you can understand it didn't pierce it, but that's a 300 yard plunging shot. So had the Confederates had brook bolts during the Battle of the Ironclads, who knows what might have happened. Nevertheless, at uh, 10 o'clock, approximately, the Naugatuck will fire her third round from her parrot gun, and the parrot gun bursts. And so she drops out of action. The only good that the Roostock and the Port Royal are doing are firing against John Taylor Wood and his skirmishers. Well, so this battle will continue on. Um, and it's a slow battle, as I've said. At 11.15, a shot, which the South Side Artillery says is one of their guns. The crew of the Virginia says, oh no, it's one of our guns. One of, if a shot goes through the Galena, right as a powder monkey is bringing up some cartridges to reload the gun and the shell, of course, blows up the cartridges. The powder boy is splattered within the ship. And so, and great smoke comes out of the Galena. So the Galena um, will actually break off action after that. It's 11.30 in the morning. So this action has gone from 7.30 to 11.30, a four action, four hour action. That's very slow, slide please. And when I say slow, uh, it's just how fast they can load and reload the guns. So slide please. And um, what's happening is the Confederates, now you can see this is the Galena at the very moment that shell hits her. And this of course, is an eight inch Columbiad. And if you can look right down the river, you can see a gunboat. This is taken after um, the uh, battle is over by Timothy O'Sullivan. And you can see that gunboat. You can look at the range the Confederate gun has. So this is taken right after the abandonment of Richmond uh, on April 2nd, 1865. But this is the type of gun that is going to guard this gateway to Richmond. Slide, please. Now, so basically, the Confederates are jubilant about their victory. I have to tell you, uh, one uh, Confederate wrote, the Monitor was astonished and the Galena admonished, and their efforts to ascend the stream were mocked at, while the dreaded Naugatuck, with the hardest kind of luck, was very nearly knocked into a cocked hat. You know, this is a great Confederate victory and they know it to be true. Actually, after the battle, they drop down river and as they're dropping down river, John Taylor Wood, who knew the commander of the Monitor very well, Lieutenant William Jeffers, and he'll shout from the riverbank, Tell Jeffers that's the wrong way to Richmond as they're retreating down the river. I want to tell you, William Keeler, who is um, assistant, acting assistant paymaster on the monitor, will actually talk about uh, that how that the Confederates put shot through the sides of the Galena with great precision. He actually, when he goes on the Galena, talks to John Rogers, says this ship is obviously uh, not shot proof. Slide, please. And as Galena, as, as, um, as Keeler um, will go through the ship, he is shot. He will say that the Galena was hit 43 times, 13 shots had penetrated the iron. Her railings were shot away, the smokestack riddled, and she suffered 24 casualties. The, he then said it looked like a slaughterhouse. The sides and ceiling overhead, the ropes and gun were splattered with blood and brains and lumps of flesh. 
while the ducks were covered with large pools of half-congealed blood and strewn with portions of skulls, fragments of shells, arms, legs, hands, pieces of flesh, iron splinters of wood, broken weapons were mixed in one confused, horrible mess. Now, he wrote that to his wife, so you can imagine. You know, uh, but the big thing is, is that the galena has been proven to be not an effective um, ironclad. Actually, they'll take the iron off the galena. She'll later serve as a wooden frigate. Actually, she fights at the Battle of Mobile Bay. Now, I have to tell you that uh, Abraham Lincoln will visit the galena um, when she's anchored off Harrison's Landing, protecting McClellan's army that had fallen back after the Seven Days Battles to this protected anchorage on the James River. Now, Lincoln says, oh my gosh, I cannot understand how any of you escaped this live. And um, so I thank you all for your service. He's talking to the entire crew. Roger steps forward. Well, we really, the people that saved the day were Corporal John F. Mackey, USMC, Quartermaster Jeremiah Regan, and First Class Fireman Charles Kenyon. They all, Lincoln immediately says, these are heroes for all time, and they, he awards each of them a Medal of Honor. Slide, please. And that's that, that right there is Mackey. This is John Taylor Wood, who was in charge of the skirmishers. The skirmishers meant, according to John Keeler, or, or William Keeler, he will get out on top of the monitor, because, you know, the monitor during this battle, just in the turret, the temperatures reach to 110 degrees. And so they try to see some relief, trying to see what's happening with the battle, because the pilot house is not that effective. And so musketry fires upon them and, and to such an extent that Keeler will say, a shot went through my coat and another through my hat. Actually, Thomas O. Selfridge uh, will actually be wounded in the leg by a uh, musket. Um, and so the Confederates are keeping these wooden warships, the Naugatuck and everyone in the ironclads stowed inside. So they're suffering from heat exhaustion and as well as um, just the, in fact, the impact of the various shells. So John Taylor Wood, of course, this greatest line he says as the, as the Federals retreat downriver, tell Jeffers that's the wrong way to Richmond. Slide, please. And so uh, this is Jeffers himself. Uh, he was not a popular officer on the monitor when he's in command. In fact, the crew members calling themselves the monitor boys will write the former commander of the monitor, John Lomer Worden, oh, we wish you were well. We wish you'd come back here. This ship has never been the same without you. Jeffers will write a report that details how badly the monitor serves. Now, you just look to the right of that picture, and you can see an indentation um, from a shell from a brook gun, a seven-inch brook gun. So anyway, that's from the Battle of Hampton Roads, March 9th. Um, this picture doesn't show the, that real great screw-in shot from a brook bolt. He will write a report saying the monitor is terrible. Number one, you can't live in it. Number two, you can't elevate the guns. Number three, you don't have a great vision. Number four, uh, she is slow. You know, he just writes all these complaints. Erickson gets a hold of them. He goes, huh, you just don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I should have better ventilation, but you know, this ship was not meant to fire atop a hill. It is meant to defend harbors and guard against other ironclads. So Jeffers will get fired. Slide, please. And um, so basically the Battle of Drury's Bluff is a tremendous event. It is a four-hour engagement. The fortifications had been so quickly constructed by the Confederates, and yet using the best guns they could use, 
using the top of the bluff, they will be able to actually defeat the federal fleet or flotilla as we will call it. Uh, every Union ship is going to be damaged. They fall back down river. Actually, John Rogers will send a telegram to McClellan. If you bring me a division of troops, we'll take this place. A and he's right because the Drury's Bluff or Fort Darling as we also call it, has no land defenses at this time. So you can well imagine the ships in the river and troops attacking the rear of Fort Darling. They would have captured it and Richmond would have fallen. But McClellan replies to that telegram saying, I'm too occupied with what I'm doing now to send you any help. Um, obviously, McClellan's campaign will fail in many reasons because he relies on the Navy to guard his flanks, carry his supplies, and support his army as it reaches towards Richmond. But the very thing he relied on, the U.S. Navy, needed his help as well to be able to strike at Richmond. Richmond should have been captured on May 15, 1862 which would have changed how we look at America. And that, my friends, is the Battle of Drury's Bluff. Once again, my name is John Forstein. I'm Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariner's Museum and Park in Newport News. While we are closed right now, we are offering up, thanks to Mike, uh, a series of uh, Zoom lectures, so to speak. Um, we have one every other Friday from the Mariner's Museum, which you can log in via um, the Mariner's Museum website. Um, and in fact, I have one Friday, and this Friday at two o'clock. I also do a weekly blog post about uh, the navies during the Civil War. Uh, this week, uh, the blog is uh, uh, going to come out as the uh, capture or the Battle of Fort Fisher, and then my lecture is also on the capture of Fort Fisher. So anyway, without further ado, I so appreciate every one of you all who uh, view this program and your deep appreciation for the Civil War. Without your caring, without your support, and without your interest, you know, places like the Mariners Museum could not preserve and present things like the USS Monitor. So I thank you.